GPU computing to go by Arne from Dev Universe. Hello everyone. So um, tomorrow there's, there's actually a player dev room about Go being used for all kinds of web services and so on. This is something completely different. Um, we're using Go here for a purpose that was not intentionally um, intended to. So um, I mainly want to give you some feeling how well is Go suited, what are um, the pros and cons with Go for scientific computing. I'm sharing this from my own um, experience at Ghent University, where I have been uh, developing a so-called micromagnetic simulation program um, that can be used to um, model, for instance, hard disks, magnetic ramps, and so on. Um, since this is the scientific HPC session, I'm allowed to show at least a little bit of science. So just to give you an idea, this is the partial differential equation that we have to solve. Um, for many, many millions of discretization cells and many, many millions of time steps. And it covers all the different sides all with each other, so it's pretty um, computationally intensive. So um, that's number crunching part we mainly offload the, uh, the GPU now. But there's lots of other codes than just so typically uh, the, the bottleneck is only 10% of your code and you still have 90% of your code left and you have other stuff. And that we decided to try to write in Go uh, just for fun. So our implementation for this problem uh, with CUDA and Go uh, was only around 11,000 lines. And if you compare it to some other programs that do basically the same thing, they uh, use some C++ together with a scripting language, and they require like really a multitude uh, of these lines of code. So um, yeah, it's been really um, a good. Uh, choice in terms of productivity, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Go is like a complete smooth ride for uh, computational agents. So what are the strengths and, uh, and the weaknesses here? Um, so I will show this in three scenarios. What if you're doing pure Go number crunching? Uh, what if you're calling some <laughs> external library, C, C++, or maybe Kuna? And finally, what if you need concurrency in your program? Maybe I should introduce a little bit Go for the people who might not know it. So it's a compiled statically typed language. So, so basically you expect it to be quite fast, but at the same time you get garbage collection, memory safety, some dynamic features. Um, yeah, so it's somewhere in between scripting and uh, say C++. Typically a programming, a programming language is introduced by some Hello World program. Um, I'm going to show a Hello Math program. Um, this is uh, some actual Go code that calls some uh, things in the standard math library. I'm going to compile it and run it in my browser. It actually worked. Um, so it showcases a few of the nice features of Go if you want to do some mathematical stuff, some number crunching. Uh, it has precise compile time pulses, so this expression is not truncated to zero, it's handled precisely. Um, there's complex numbers right into the standard library, that's handy. Uh, even special functions like these bastards are just in the standard library very handy. And there's even out-of-the-box support for large arbitrary precision numbers, like this very large binomial uh, expansion here that you can get just out of the standard library. So that's pretty nice. Um, however, uh, some sort of missing features are most notably matrices and matrix libraries. These, uh, these you do not get out of the box, so you will have to uh, get them elsewhere. Okay, um, having some math is a nice thing, but how about performance, of course? This is a high performance session, so how well does Go perform? Um, let me uh, show a simple dot product example. This is Go code to make the dot product of these two vectors just the uh, sum of the product of elements. And you can very easily benchmark this with uh, Go's built-in testing and benchmarking framework. So um, you have to write some benchmark dot function. It has to start with benchmark. Uh, that just sets up uh, inputs and calls the function a number of times. And then we execute command go test minus bench and it will like scan through our source, look for all the functions called benchmark something and it will properly time them in a statistically meaningful manner. So we have to wait a little bit. And it called our function 100,000 times to get an average runtime of a, so, some uh, two microseconds per operation. Okay, so it's nice to have this benchmarking built right into uh, your tool chain. There's also, also um, unit testing in this way, so that's uh, handy. There's also profiling built in. Um, so you can just out of the box get a call graph from your program at runtime 
and it shows how much time is being spent in every function and it makes some bigger blocks like to highlight like here you are uh, wasting some time, spending some time so you can focus your um, optimization efforts over there. Okay, that's all nice to have, but how about really bare performance? So we go back to the dot product example and I've compared it to the exact same code in some other languages. So uh, this is a native Go compiler, it also has GCC support. Um, and you see that it's actually pretty close to um, portable C code, so that's quite nice. Um, typically, not only here, but like in general, you will sacrifice around some ballpark 10% performance for which you get in return uh, array bound checking, uh, garbage collection, and so on. However, it can still be several times slower than really machine tuned C code. So that's a trade off you make. So, though it's fast enough for everyday use, it's probably not a good idea to write the next Lapak or so in uh, Go. So, we'll just um, yeah, take that from elsewhere. Okay, so number crunching in pure Go is quite okay because there's a lot of built in stuff. Uh, the managed memory really cannot be overstated, uh, but you will have to get a really high performance libraries maybe elsewhere. So that's uh, the second part. Um, how about calling some external library from Go, um, whether it's standard C stuff or um, CUDA to uh, offload your memory crunching to the GPU. So you can do that, it's not that hard in Go. Um, you need to have some special comments. Uh, to include your C headers and even your linker flags you put right in the source code so there's no special build system you build your code just like you always do and this is an example where I'm calling a CUDA library to ask for uh, the name of my GPU let's go for Linux is it, it's important. Yeah. so um, this has now called NVIDIA's uh, CUDA driver to ask my GPU name um, so okay this works but it's a bit unwieldy I don't like to uh, write this all the time and there's also conversions to and from uh, C types and Go types all the time. So what you really want is an idiomatic Go library if you're going to do these things. Um, so I, I've written one for CUDA and you can find them for other libraries and maybe write them yourself. And Go makes it actually quite easy to import a third party library. So you import something by URL. So if anyone's interested you can find the source code here. Um, you install it on your system with go get, that kind of URL, and that's it. Um, so this code does really the same thing, but now it's a geometric uh, Go program. And uh, one nice thing is also that these dependencies, these extra libraries, do not have to be deployed to your cluster system. So they are always compiled in, you don't generate additional dependencies. Go um, binaries are typically statically linked, so it's really easy to deploy. Okay. Um, so being able to call C is one thing, but we're also sharing memory between Go and C. So won't that be a problem because Go is garbage collected and C is not? So fortunately, you don't need to worry about it. Um, Go is aware of C's memory space, yes, which will never accidentally garbage collect something that was was malloced by C. Um, and it even gets better because uh, the memory that's allocated by Go is always very nicely aligned. Yes, so we can pass it on to. Um, libraries that use SSD instructions or AVX, it doesn't matter. Um, basically, you will allocate and go, have C crunch for numbers, and you don't need to worry about freeing any memory. Um, so that's a nice productivity boost. Memory management is just taken, taken out of your hands. <coughs> All right, so to wrap this up, when you're calling uh, external C programs, um, sorry, external C libs from Go, there's a downside that you have to write some C wrappers or find them, hopefully they are available. Um, but on the upside, you can call C and you get a huge productivity boost because you can have Go manage your C memory. Alright, um, this brings me already to a um, final section, that's concurrency. Yeah, so concurrency means that your program is doing several things at the same time, not necessarily in parallel, but like really different tasks at the same time. Um, if you go back to our real world, world example, our micromagnetic um, simulation code, um, some of the things we want to do concurrently with our uh, computations, for instance I.O. We don't want to interrupt the GPU calculations just to save some data to the disk, it has to be parallel. And also we have um, an interactive GUI that runs in a, in a web browser. 
and yeah, this GUI has to remain uh, responsive even though there's a CPU thread taking 100% uh, of the cycle still to keep the GPU humming. So, yeah, obviously you can do multi-threading and concurrency in any programming language, um, but Go makes it really easy to do that by building in uh, concurrency primitives right into the language. So, for instance, for our disk I.O., uh, so we have one thread that's always fully spinning to keep the GPU busy. Um, and then uh, we can spawn a lot of worker threads that do some expensive uh, conversion of the data and then flush it to disk. And uh, with Go, it's really easy to um, share data between those threads with a so-called channel. And so, uh, that's really a uh, Go idiom, Go channel. It's a bit uh, like the Unix pipe, actually. So you put data in from one side and data comes out on the other side. And uh, it has some nice arrow syntax to put data in and out uh, on the pipe. And uh, this is basically the code you need to do asynchronous I.O. So in your main function, uh, we're going to start a, uh, a worker function, run I.O. in this case, which will just loop forever. This is an infinite loop. And just forever it will take data from this pipe and do some expensive save operation on it. And we start this. Uh, function in the background, so in a separate thread, this go keyword is like like an ampersand and bash, just rather than a different thread. And then we, pipe, we, we put data in this pipe that comes out here and it's handled. So we have just in a few lines of code, really nice um, uh, yeah, concurrency. So in our real uh, simulation program, it's just a handful of lines and they speed it up the I.O. sometimes by a factor of two. Um, so these are the kinds of things you can uh, can expect. You do basically the same stuff. You can also do in other languages, but there you would need hands full of mutexes and callbacks and so on to implement uh, maybe something simple as this. Now, if, if this was the only use of channels, okay, it would be of quite limited use, but it becomes extremely powerful um, when you combine it with Go's um, select statement. And uh, this is a bit like. Um, like a switch which has cases and maybe a default, but it switches over channels. And what the select does, it, it checks if there's something available in the channel, it will take the value from the channel and execute whatever code is here. And if there's nothing available, it does some default uh, calculation. And this is something that uh, is very useful, for instance, for this interactive uh, web interface. So um, I will show you in a minute, the user can click on buttons and change variable values uh, while the simulation is still running. It's not pausing for that. So you have always the, um, the risk of concurrently modifying, like you, you modify a variable while, it, while it's being read. So typically you would have new texts and state looking and so on. Um, so here it's not necessary. We're, we're always doing calculations. Um, when our web server um, wants to change a value because we push the button, um, it puts, puts here in the pipe a function, so Go has a full closure, so you can just have functions as values, send them through pipes and so on. So the web server sends a function with the work we have to do. It comes out on the other end in our main loop, and then we wait, so after a calculation has been done, then it's a good time to execute that function, just a little piece of code, but then we are sure uh, that we are setting this variable uh, when we are not actually using it. So. That's a very simple way to avoid hundreds of uh, mutexes. So one of these codes that I showed has really lots and lots of locking. And if you forget to lock and unlock one of these variables, then you get um, race conditions and your code may fail, but you will never know that you have the wrong result and so on. Um, so that, that's the final design we have. And one note, um, if you somehow still manage to get race conditions anyway, if you manage to mess it up, even though the nice um, Comparison <coughs> primitives are there. Go has also built in race testing. So you just build your code like this, and if you manage to do um, simultaneous read and write of a variable, you'll get a nice report telling you uh, if you messed things up. Okay, for the little bit of time. Um, so if you need concurrency and Go, it's extremely, <coughs> um, yeah, it's an extremely pleasant experience, and in, uh, in my opinion. Uh, to which I really have not encountered any downsides yet. So just to give you an idea of what you can do with only 11,000 lines of, uh, of Go compared to maybe 100,000 lines of C++ in other cases, I will show a little uh, demonstration. So, so this 
So I have um, written some input scripts. Um, yeah, that doesn't matter. So it's um, this was an input script that um, simulates a spinning hard drive. I will execute it right now. And so now this this could this could be running remotely on some cluster. But if I want to, I can uh, open my browser, connect to the node where it's running on, and I get um, this interface showing me the status of my simulation, how, how well it's doing. Um, this completely does not slow down the simulation. So I I really tested it's it's running completely concurrently. The GPU does not stop its work uh, just for serving the food. And in this case, um, we are simulating a spinning uh, hard disk platter. So um, here we are looking at a small piece from a, from a hard disk platter that is a few micrometers large. And we are looking at the, really at a nanometer uh, length scale. And here there is some right head um, that produces a magnetic field, which is writing bits uh, onto a, uh, on our hard disk. So uh, white means the magnetization of the platter uh, points up, black means it points down, and then uh, here the alternating field is writing a series of um, bits which are moving at around uh, 7,200 RPM. Um, and I can just, I can, um, there's uh, live plotting of um, what's going on, and I can change some parameters here um, live. So this is updated right away. Uh, without any uh, risk of race conditions and so on. So that's just uh, 10,000 lines or 11,000 lines of Go code, a factor of 10 less of what um, similar uh, implementation. So that's what you can expect basically from a Go for uh, Thank you. Two questions? Yeah, so how did you do your matrix calculations? Um, yeah, so using, uh, using CUDA. Um, so there are lots of... Um, we all the, we all it to CUDA, which has matrix libraries on board. Uh, and then the few things that had to be handwritten in CUDA, so were handwritten, and then wrapped as... Uh, yeah, so you can call C. So you write basically some C function, and you call it um, from Go. And I also... Um, to simplify this, so let me maybe show an extra slide for this at the same time. So, uh, yeah, so basically, if you if you are if you write your own matrix uh, stuff and in CUDA you need to write some kernel, um, then typically you would write a, a wrapper for that kernel, which is also C code, and then you would have to write a Go wrapper for that C wrapper. So that works, but that's a bit annoying. So I also wrote a little um, utility CUDA to go that um, just does this task for you. So it reads your CUDA kernel and it immediately outputs a pure go um, file with a nice wrapper in it. And uh, CUDA kernel is included in the go source as PTX assembly. So you do not uh, introduce any additional uh, dependencies in this way. So this go file can even be compiled without the need for NVGS compiler anymore. So you can really easily deploy it to, to people who want to compile it for their system and they don't even need uh, NVCC. So, uh, so that's uh, it also uh, support for sparse NVCs? Uh, no. So um, this is just this, this wraps any kernel you do, but I yeah, I have some stencil operations and so on, but I think I need any uh, sparse stuff. Sorry for that. Maybe someone else has. <laughs> if they do, then you can just wrap it in this way I call it from the One more question? Oh. Oh. Do you have one of these? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to buy this one. Um, well, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any more questions? questions. <laughs> <laughs>